Hey everybody, this is Shannon here. Um, so in case you couldn't tell by the title, we are just going over, um, going over, God, I spliced together some old Patreon episodes for the episode for today. Um, I messed up the schedule a little bit and we didn't have time to record one of mine before we went to visit Hannah. So this is what we're doing instead. Uh, I know our schedule has been a little funky, um, but after this week, it'll be back to normal. Um, so the episodes today are... The first one was one of Hannah's. It is about Dingus Day, which is a Polish-American holiday, I believe. I didn't have time to look it up, sorry. Um, you'll learn all about it in just a second. <laughs> um, the next one is one of mine. It is uh, my sister and I talking on the phone. So my sister is on speakerphone, and we are discussing the Black Sox scandal. And then the last one is one of Shelby's, and she is discussing... Um, Gustavus Adolphus or Gus. Um, she's mentioned Gus on the podcast before. It's just going over like his biography and stuff. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I needed to tell everybody. That's not true. If in this opening there's weird clicky noises, I have no idea what those are from and I'm sorry. Yeah, that's really it. Uh, the audio for the rest of them is fine. Uh, so yeah, here are the Patreon episodes. Okay, <laughs> okay, I'm so excited because so, I don't know what this is. <laughs> just for intro, uh, this is our March VSC, which we were not able to do until today. This will be posted um, like a half an hour after we record it, so. So don't worry about it. Yeah. Just be cool. Everyone be cool. <laughs> um, okay, today, we- <laughs> Shelby's not here, it's just me and Shannon, um. <laughs> Shannon doesn't know what this is, but to all my Polish brethren out there, today we're going to talk about Dingus Day. <laughs> I'm so excited. Okay. <clears throat> you ready for the Shannon? Yes, I am. So, Schmigus Dingus is um, a Roman Catholic <laughs> celebration. I'm reading straight off of Wikipedia, by the way. Um, that is held on Easter Monday. Uh, usually just... Uh, it, it's all it's all over Central Europe, but, like, really, when you think about Dingus Day or Schmigus Dingus, you're thinking of the Poles, because uh, we like to get weird. I know I talk a lot on here about being Irish, but I'm also very Polish. Um, yeah. Okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's like particularly celebrated by the um, Polish diaspora communities. So um, I'm sure you don't know where Macedon, New York is, Shannon, but I don't know. It's sister city is Hoosick Falls. And that's where my grandma lives. My Polish grandma. Okay. Um, so like, it's a big deal. Uh, anyway, the reason I wanted to talk about Dingus Day is because my cousins and I today celebrated it early. Um, we didn't do any of the weird shit that I'm about to tell you about, but we did play... <laughs> Pierogi Russian roulette. I guess pierogi Polish roulette. Um, oh, now I because want pierogi. We... Oh, there's... we just ate so many pierogies. I wasn't going to order food, but I really want pierogi. <laughs> Hold on, I'm uh, fix my microphone really Sorry, quick. continue. There isn't a pierogi place in Champagne. I checked. That's I'm so sad. Now that you're conditioned to love them. <laughs> I know. Like, they sell it. I, hopefully they'll sell it at grocery stores, which, like, I actually do have some in the freezer, but the place I order from has cake and is really good, so I'm going to order it instead. <laughs> <laughs> it's do really you know what we had for a vegetable? I want you to guess what our vegetable was to have with our pierogies <sighs> and potato pancakes, not counting the potato as a vegetable. I'm leaning cabbage for some reason. That that is a good guess, but no, we did not have cabbage. Okay, I don't know that. Think That's my like guess. Okay, we had pickles. That was our. <laughs> oh, I never would have gotten that. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> that is such a whatever. Okay. Anyway, we had a shit ton of pickles uh, that had SpongeBob on them for some reason. Huh? They were from Target. I don't know. They they were like they tasted like overnight pickles because they weren't very like pickly. Pickly, yeah, they were more yeah. cucumbery in a bath sort of <laughs> flavor. In a I salty even, bath. I can't even have pickles anymore half the time, so I haven't eaten them in like two years. Oh well, so that sucks I miss for you. pickles. I love pickles. I can't eat them. All anymore. right. So anyway, that's that's what made me think of this because I was just gonna read, do a dramatic reading of an email, but then I decided that was kind of stupid. Um, okay. So that is sort of early, so I might have to stop to go get my food. Hopefully not. Hopefully Ugh, we'll be okay. done. But. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Schmigus Dingus again. Um, and again, I know it just sounds so funny. Um, so, on Dingus Day, or Schmigus Dingus, uh, <laughs> this is so fucking stupid, but I love it. And I don't know why this happens. Okay, so traditionally, boys 
will get a bucket of water or something similar and corner girls and throw the water on them and then gently spank them on the back of their legs (laughs) with either a switch or a pussy willow depending on the region and this happens easter monday which i don't understand is this children or adults as well no, I think uh, all these pictures are showing adults. Okay. That makes it yep, worse. these men have mustaches. Oh, God. <laughs> um, yeah, so then also, <laughs> that's like the weirdest thing that we, we do uh, is that. Um, but it also um, has like door-to-door stuff. So like you go around okay. begging. Kind of like, kind of like wassailing, was- wassail, whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's like the weirdest thing. Now I'm going to read you this dingus song. (laughs) Um, where's this from? No, yeah, this is Polish. Okay. (laughs) Your duck has told me that you've baked a cake and your hen has told me she's laid you a basket and a half of eggs. Your sow has told me that you've killed her son. If not her son, then her little daughter. Give me something. If only a bit of her fat, who will not be generous today? Let him not count on heaven. So basically, okay. after after Easter, and after you have your big Easter celebration, because remember, like, everyone in Poland, you're either uh, Catholic or Jewish. And so <laughs> after Easter, if you, you, like, go around and collect all these things, and if not, then, uh, I don't know, the, the poor swear at you. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, let's see. Yeah, so sometimes the, um, you know, do you know what Palm Sunday is, Shannon? I know, like, what it is, but I don't know, like, what traditions or, like, actions go along with it. So in some places, yeah. Um, so in some places, instead of, uh, I guess I should explain that to people who are not Catholic, because I always forget. (laughs) I Did I tell you what I texted my Jewish friend the other day when we were sitting in class? I don't think so. He had all the lights off and he was kind of sitting there like a creep, just in the dark. <laughs> uh-huh. I was like, what'd you do? Give up electricity for Lent? And then I was like, oh my God, Hannah, not everyone is Catholic. <laughs> um, <laughs> anywho, I forget. Yeah, um, that's fair. But what was I saying? Oh, Palm Sunday. So Palm Sunday is when we celebrate uh, Jesus's arrival in Jerusalem before he done got murdered <laughs> um and so in the in the bible there's a part where like all these people are like putting down palms and like their cloaks and stuff so that the the cult that he's riding on doesn't have to touch the ground or whatever so okay. we bless palms and it's just a reminder of like uh we led him into the city to die oh my god here comes my dad on a video call i'll call you back um <laughs> Um, okay, but in some places in Poland, instead of blessing palms for Palm Sunday, they'll do <laughs> they'll do the pussy willows so that you can go beat someone after church. <laughs> I guess you have a whole week. A week and a day you have to wait. Gotcha. Which, you know, that's fine. Um, <laughs> but anyway, there's so- a saying. I'm not going to try to say it. Maybe I should try to say it. That would make this funnier. I'm going to try to say it. What was your question? No, uh, my question was more just like a summation kind of thing. Like, literally the entire point of this is for boys to, like, kind of attack girls that they like. Yeah, kind of. Um, All right, cool. (laughs) Just making sure I understand. Boys would sneak into girls' homes at daybreak on Easter Monday and throw containers of water over their heads while they were still in bed. (laughs) After all the water had been thrown, the screaming girls would often be dragged to a nearby river or pond for another drenching. (laughs) Are they witches? Like, what the hell? No, they're just Polish girls. Um, Sometimes a girl would be carried out, still in her bed, before both bed and girl were thrown into the water together. This happens every Easter Monday. Particularly attractive girls would be expected would expect to be soaked repeatedly during the day. I think it's like a, I have a crush on you, therefore I'm going to assault you, <laughs> kind of a thing. It's like a more like um, codified version of like pulling on their pigtails. Except- <laughs> yeah, except you throw a girl in a river. <laughs> Um, the use of water is said to evoke the spring raids that need to ensure a successful harvest later that year. Girls okay. can save themselves from soaking by giving boys ransom, so painted eggs. They would, that's a, that's another, uh, okay. thing about it. Like, you, there, it, it might be traced back to this, like, ancient Hungarian thing. Wait, maybe not Hungarian. What's the word I'm looking for? 
Polish. Maybe Hungarian was no, it is Hungary. Oh, and Le- Lechik nations. Anyway, the West Slavic tribes. Okay. Tribes. Um, it would be like their ransom. That's what. That's maybe what um, Dingus means. It might mean ah. like ransom. Um, Interesting. So they could pay in their ransoms, their their painted eggs, uh, and it would like save them from being soaked. Um, so they were uh, Interesting. The, the eggs. I know the eggs were regarded as a magical charm that would bring good harvest, successful relationships, and healthy childbirths. Although the theory, although in theory the girls are supposed to wait until the following day to get their revenge by soaking the boys in practices both sexes throw water over each other on the same day so girls can do it too but it's like traditionally boys would like kidnap you and throw you into a fucking river oh my god all right now i'm going to attempt to say this thing in polish um oh god all right no i'm not um (laughs) (laughs) i listened to it and that was too hard yeah polish is hard it's so hard none of those i was looking at what was the word because I just had it up. I'll tell you. Yeah, we have ten whole minutes left. Okay. Um, the <laughs> word was... Where's my Google Translate? Oh, loser. Because we were playing Russian or Polish roulette with pierogies. Because... Okay, and here's the thing. Because I can't remember how many we had. But we had one box that was loaded baked potato pierogies. And the other okay. one was just like four cheese, medley, whatever. Yeah. Um hold on my mic got weird um so i put them all together in the pan but there were only two of one of them and then like six of the other Uh uh-huh so gotcha (laughs) it was like whoever got the one was the loser all right i'm gonna play you a sound bite now and i want you to tell me what you think this word starts with ready like what letter yeah listen uh i play again (laughs) My instinct is a J, but that's probably wrong. Listen. Przegrany. An S or a Z or something? This word, ha- it starts with an S sound. You're right. However, the first two letters in this word are P-R. Polish is weird. <laughs> Polish is fucking <laughs> stupid. No offense. Love you, Poland. I'm coming to visit you soon. Um i love your pottery i love your people i am your people um but you know you know what you are anyway uh it's another one of those languages where the uh sounds are made up and the letters don't matter yeah kind of thing (laughs) it uses the latin alphabet but like no it doesn't what what is that word like what does it mean loser it's Ah. like because i was saying you're a loser but then i was like i can't say this yeah because i had looked at the word and the pr confused me so much that i could not start with an s like i could not make myself start that word with an s (laughs) anyway it's not even an s it's prz um okay interesting all right so uh back to the pussy willows that were blessed on palm sunday um following okay wait Uh, Pussy willows appeared to have been adopted as an alternative method in the palm leaves use elsewhere in Easter celebrations, which were not obtainable in Poland. So, like, yeah, (laughs) it's like hard to get palm leaves. I'm really surprised we got them up here in Maine, to be honest. Well, I mean, it's kind of like in, is it Ireland? They use turnips instead of pumpkins for jack-o'-lanterns. At least they used to because they didn't have pumpkins. (laughs) Okay, first of all, the um, Irish invented jack-o'-lanterns. And there was no Colombian exchange yet back when they yeah. invented them, so there wouldn't have been pumpkins. Yeah. So. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You use what's All around. Right. Yes. Excuse yeah. me, I just threw up on you. I know, I um, heard. <laughs> cool. All right, so it was hard to get palms in Poland because, Duh. clearly. Um, <laughs> um, so they were breast, breast, oh my god. <laughs> they were blessed by a priest. On Palm Sunday, following which the parishioners whipped each other with the pussy willow branches, saying, "Should I try saying this? I might try it." Niabia, Jizvabia. Oh fuck! You're talking too fast. Talk slower. I can't do it. It's too hard. Okay. Oh my god! It's still talking. Shut up. <laughs> um. Basically. I can't speak, but it says, It is not me who strikes the willow strikes in a week, holy days, in six nights, Easter. (laughs) 
basically. Here comes logic Easter, of gonna... guns don't peel, kill people, people kill people. It's like the opposite. I'm not hitting you. <laughs> this pussy is. willow is hitting you. <laughs> For Easter. <laughs> Um, then the pussy willows were treated as sacred charms that could prevent lightning strikes, protect animals, and encourage honey production. (laughs) All right. (laughs) I love Catholicism. (laughs) We are interesting people. Um, they were then believed to bring health and good fortune to people as well. And it was traditional for three pussy willow buds to be swallowed on Palm Sunday to promote good health. Oh, I did not know that about Shmigus Dingus. (sighs) Um, yes, so as with the water throwing, boys would whip girls with the pussy willows on Easter Monday, and girls would do the same to boys on the following Tuesday. I don't think the Tuesday has a name, though. Does it? I don't know. Uh, I don't know either. Anywho, let's read one more thing. That girls had their own version of, um, that's, what am I looking at? Anyway, um, like the going door to door thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to say it. Yeah. Podingushi. Mm, I don't know. That might be a Z sound. Who really I, knows? I, it's, uh, anyway, you're asking the wrong in which they would person. go from <laughs> they would go from door to door carrying um, freshly cut green branches or <laughs> I don't know how to say this. It's three letters. Let's see if I'm at all right. Guy, but it's spelled G A J. Cool. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so they would carry around freshly cut green branches, seeking food and singing songs, welcoming the new year that followed Easter, saying, Our green little tree, beautifully decked, goes everywhere, for it is proper that it should. We go with it to the manor house, wishing good fortune, good health for this new year which God has given us. So, like that other one where um, the the other dingus song that was like, Your duck told me, and Mm -hmm. if you don't give me something, you're going to (laughs) die. This is the girl's version. It's much Um, less fun than the other one, which that's normal for gendered things like that i, I don't know it's kind of cute though because there's yeah. this like nice and the boys one is like i don't know if it's just boys i think other people sing that too mm-hmm. nope it was boys um this would be pushed from okay yeah it was boys uh <laughs> would crow like roosters and sing the di- the dingus songs <laughs> conveying good wishes and requesting for gifts and food <laughs> god boys are so stupid <laughs> this is such a mm. <sighs> definitely a man came up with this yeah <laughs> Um, anyway, so this probably, like I said, it can be traced back to the, um, Western Slavic tribes, which, uh, because of that word that means ransom. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, um, originally Shmigus and Dingus were two separate events with Shmigus involving the act of throwing water and Dingus bribing people with, uh, the, like the eggs, the ransom Mm -hmm. eggs to be saved from the shmigus um but then it was merged and everyone was like woo whatever <laughs> do your own thing cool. oh um and it may in 1410 it was forbidden by the bishop of i'm not even going to attempt that town <laughs> to pester or plague others with what is universally called dingus <laughs> <laughs> so that my friend is the really botched history of shmigus <laughs> dingus um or uh dingus day in america when you initially told me about this i thought this was a farley family thing no this is I a literally never poland heard thing yeah there's some other people who celebrate it uh it was mostly poland and hungary and then like mm-hmm. people from poland who live in the united states yeah. so like big places in the u.s that it's celebrated are buffalo new york macedon new york which is where my family's from uh well from near there cleveland ohio south bend indiana pasadena california and pine creek wisconsin you'd think it would be in chicago we have a lot of polish people here but apparently not i don't know what to tell interesting. you these are the ones that have like the biggest ones that's I think. true um my food's on the way so Good thing we're about done. Right. <laughs> yes, that is really all I have for you. Okay, cool. Um, so you can say on Easter Monday, you can wish people a 
Happy Dingus Day. And in the, the same way that everyone is Irish on St. Patrick's Day, everyone is Polish on Dingus Day. <laughs> so tell your friends, spray people with water. Oh, yeah. And now in modern times, you can use a squirt gun. Um, Much Fun better. fact. <laughs> so go for it. Go have a squirt, a water gun fight. It'll be great. It'll be wonderful. Happy Dingus Day, everybody. <laughs> We are recording now. Let's see. Okay. I have you turned up as high as it can go, so hopefully my mic can hear you, but it probably can because it usually picks up everything, so. Okay. Uh, crap. I meant to, like, write out an intro for us, and then I forgot, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is a Patreon very special episode. This is Shannon. I'm here with my sister, Allison. Allie, say hi. Why'd you call me Allison? I always do. <laughs> say hi. hi. Oh, hi. Okay, it's mostly picking you up, so I think we'll be good. Okay, and today we are going to talk about the Blacks, Black Sox scandal, which we're covering it on this for multiple reasons, one of which being when I told Hannah and Shelby we were going to do this, Hannah said, is this a sports thing? And, uh, I didn't think that would be something that those two would be interested in. And Allison is. So. Stop calling me Allison. <laughs> okay, so sources are Wikipedia, which, do you even listen to our show, Allie? Um, I've meant to, I keep forgetting. Yeah, I kind of have figured. it on my podcast list. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> we use Wikipedia for, like, every single episode. I don't think there's a single episode where somebody hasn't used Wikipedia. Um, and then the only other one I really used was this, like, article, I guess, written by some faculty member at University of Missouri, Kansas City. So, yeah, that's all I have for sources, but this is a smaller episode, so I didn't want to go too far into it. Okay, so, the background. This is about the 1919 Chicago White Sox baseball team. Uh, the main players that were involved, there are a few other ones from both this team and other teams that were involved, but these were like the eight main players. First baseman Arnold Chick Gandal, and because it's the 1900s, they all have hysterical nicknames. There's... I put Porsche instead of Pitcher. How in the world did I do that? I was looking at that like, I don't want to say sports, but I'm going to go with it. Pitcher. How did I do that? I literally type, or I guess it's Portia, Eddie Pitcher, or Eddie Seacott. Okay, so it's Pitcher Eddie Seacott. How did I do that? Okay. Center fielder Oscar Happy Felsch. Outfielder, Shoeless Joe Jackson, who he's probably uh, the most... He's the most recognizable. Yeah, yeah. And his involvement is questionable, too. Um, utility infielder, Fred McMullen, which, what is a utility infielder? That means he can play, like, every position. Oh, okay. That so makes sense. He probably played third to second base, because usually first basemen aren't really considered... Um, like utility but he probably played a lot of the infield infield positions okay thank you uh also there was shortstop charles swede risberg god these names third baseman george buck weaver and then pitcher claude lefty williams i put pitcher that time so i have no idea how i did that like (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) ah that's okay okay so those were the players that were involved so the owner of the White Sox at the time was Charles Comiskey. Um, the f- 
field where the White Sox play is it's guaranteed rate field right now, right? Yeah, but it used to be Comiskey Park. Yeah, it used to be Comiskey. I, for some reason, still call it Comiskey, even though I have not lived That's in Chicago. Guaranteed rate field sounds stupid. It does. Um, yeah, kind of like how I keep calling it's the Enterprise Center now. And then it was the Scott Trade Center. In my head, it's the Savas Center, even though it hasn't been the Savas Center since I was, like, seven years old. Yeah, that's where the Blues play, by the way. Yeah, that's where the Blues play. The St. Yeah, Blues. I still call it the Scott Trade Center. I still call it the Savas Center, so... <laughs> well, you're about even more behind, but everyone knows it's the Scott Trade Center. I know. <laughs> the Enterprise Center, people are like, what? Yeah. So, yeah, so Comiskey was widely disliked by his players. I couldn't get, like a concrete reason as to why um like his reputation was that he was underpaying his players but that wasn't true like the team had the largest team payroll in 1919 so like they were being paid very very well so that wasn't the reason i mean they might have thought they weren't getting paid enough though true yeah and if that's the case then they're not gonna like him true yeah um so yeah there was that um Plus, apparently, he was just kind of not a nice person. Um, yeah, and so the way I'm, like, the way baseball in 1919 worked was that, like, you know, you're on a contract. You can't just leave. And at the time, there weren't any players unions or anything, so you couldn't even bargain for more money for your contract. Um, and so this is yeah, from... so... Go ahead. So basically, it's not anything like baseball is now like you have free agents and trades and a player can ask to leave and most likely they're gonna be let go because if you have a player on your team that doesn't want to play there like that's dumb yeah but back then basically an owner paid you like almost directly and that was it you couldn't leave your team you had to stay there if you wanted to leave they were usually like oh well sorry Mm -hmm. and then just just they wouldn't they literally wouldn't let you leave so that could have been an um, issue too with some of these players may have wanted to leave the white Sox, Mm -hmm. and comiskey was like nope not gonna let you do that yeah like they really had no rights over themselves at all yeah so basically once you were signed to a team you were most likely on that team for your whole career okay um unless a uh, an owner would actually want to let you go Mm mm-hmm but there weren't, there wasn't free agency, there wasn't trades, there wasn't, you couldn't negotiate for yourself really at all. So that was probably another reason too why these players didn't like him, it's just they yeah. wanted to leave and you probably wouldn't let them. Yeah. Um, so this is from Wikipedia directly. Um, because of baseball's reserve clause, any player who refused to accept a contract was prohibited from playing baseball on any other professional team under the auspices of organized baseball. Players cannot change teams without permission from their current team, and without a union, the players have more bargaining power, which is basically what we just said. Mm-hmm. So, many players felt that they were being underpaid, plus they were probably just frustrated with how the entire thing worked, and many turned to gambling or fixing games in order to earn extra cash. Um, this theory on its own isn't fully accepted as being the cause of the Black Sox scandal, um just because, in theory, the players were really well paid. Um, But there were also cliques, like, within the team, and they kind of seemed class-based and, like, social class-based, and it just wasn't, like, a very, like, harmonious team kind of atmosphere, so that may have contributed to it as well. Mm -hmm. So, the actual conspiracy. Uh, The players met in Chick Gandel's hotel room in New York City on September 21st, 1919. They planned to fix the World Series where the White Sox were playing Cincinnati. And this means that the White Sox players would intentionally lose the series in exchange for payment from gamblers. Basically, we don't need to go into details of gambling because honestly, I don't understand it. Neither do I. Yeah, it doesn't. I don't understand. Uh, (laughs) And they approached... um, Arnold Rothstein, who was a well-known gambler to finance the scheme. They approached other people, too, but he was, like, the biggest one. The weird thing is, is, like, the players came up with it themselves. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, like, they weren't bribed into it, or they weren't, you know, approached by, like, a mobster or gangster and be like, you have to throw the World Series. They, Mm -hmm. like, it's weird that they came up with it themselves. Yeah. Like, that's, that's odd. Yeah. Especially to throw the World Series. Like, that's, you know, the yeah. their lives. And they're like, eh, we can mm-hmm. lose to make more money. It's fine. Yeah. Okay, so the actual series itself. 
So game one was on October 1st, 1919. So there were already rumors flying around that the series was fixed because apparently nobody could keep their freaking mouth shut. And a sudden <laughs> influx of money being bet on Cincinnati caused the odds against them to fall pretty rapidly. So, like, I'm going to get into this later. Comiskey knew about this the entire time. <laughs> and this was one of the reasons how he knew was because, I mean, obviously he's going to be watching the odds just because. And that's a big thing. Like, oh, this is changing really quickly. I wonder what my players are doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They didn't really hide that very well. No, they did not. Uh, and so this is from Wikipedia. After throwing a strike with his first pitch of the series, Seacott's second pitch struck Cincinnati leadoff hitter Maury Rath in the back, delivering a prearranged signal confirming the player's willingness to go through the fix. In the fourth inning, Seacott made a bad throw to Swede Reesberg at second base. Sports writers found the unsuccessful double play to be suspicious. <laughs> so they had a signal, which I think, I don't know why, I just think it's hysterical that they had a signal, because they had already planned this, like, why do you need a signal to be like, yes, we and are going to do it. just Yeah, you hit somebody <laughs> with a ball. <laughs> like, I'm not just gonna nod or, like, tip my hat, I'm just gonna chuck this baseball at this guy's back, because that'll mean I'm good, I'm good to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, by the fourth inning, they were already playing so badly that journalists were, like, they're paying. This is weird. Well, yeah, you don't make it to the worst stage and all of a sudden you suck. I mean, <laughs> sometimes you do. Well, I mean, not this bad. I know, I know. I'm just thinking of the Cardinals, how we choke every single time. <laughs> but there's, that's different. They're obviously not yeah. doing the game. They're not intentionally playing. No, 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 no. just nerves and stuff. Yeah. It's obvious when these guys are throwing the ball around like five-year-olds. Mm-hmm. People are going to catch on real quick. They're not that dumb. Mm-hmm. So throughout the rest of the series, they were, again, intentionally playing very badly. They lost, I couldn't figure out exactly how many because they didn't lose after game five. Like, they weren't out of the series after game five because the gamblers involved refused to pay the players after game five. Well, yeah, if they, went, if they went seven games, then they were pro- it was probably either tied two to two or, like, three to one. Yeah, I couldn't find, ex- I mean, I probably could have found exactly what it was, but I wasn't that worried about it. Um, it wasn't important. And so at that point, the players were obviously pissed because they were like, we're throwing away a World Series for money and now they're not giving us the money. And so they attempted to double cross the gamblers and intentionally won, well, in, as intentionally as they could, won games six and seven. But before game eight, threats of violence were made on the gamblers' behalf against players and their family members. <laughs> on the gamblers' behalf. Like, it's such a nice little thing. <laughs> Wait, there are eight games. How many yeah. games did they play? They lost game eight. So they played. They lost. They played eight games. That's dumb. Yeah. So they lost game eight and the series on October 9th, nineteen nineteen. Besides Weaver, the players involved in the scandal received five thousand dollars each or more, which was equ- equivalent to seventy four thousand dollars in twenty nineteen. With Gandal, who was like the ringleader of the whole thing, taking thirty five thousand dollars. Which was equivalent to five hundred and sixteen thousand dollars in twenty nineteen. Yeah, there's. I I bet they were mad when they weren't be, getting paid. That's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, this happened. They lost the series. Whatever. So when the night, I almost said twenty twenty. When the nineteen twenty season started, uh, obviously people were like, "How did they lo- Like, it looked suspicious the way that they had right. handled the series and so there were rumors of the fix dogging the team throughout the entire season it took until september of that year uh for seacott to confess his uh, his participation in the scheme to a grand jury and that was basically what got um the legal proceedings going because up until then nobody had confessed anything right after this comiskey comiskey suspended that's a lot of s's (laughs) comiskey suspended the rest of the involved players even though that ended up causing them the pennant that year, but he didn't really care because he was like, well, they threw it last year. Like, (laughs) so, oh my God, I have so many typos in this thing. I put eight players in give gamblers, eight (laughs) players in five gamblers were charged with conspiracy uh, to defraud. God, I put with conspiracy with defraud. It's conspiracy to defraud on October 22nd, 1920. So on top of this, the players who hadn't been involved... So, like, 
what 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 was the name for them? I think their name for them was like the Clean Socks or something. They had like a nickname for them too for the players who weren't involved. Um, they were all given bonus checks in the amount of fifteen hundred dollars, which was equivalent to nineteen thousand a hundred dollars in twenty nineteen. By Comiskey in the fall of 1920, the amount equaling the difference between the winners and losers share for participation in the 1919 World Series. So basically, the people who weren't involved were given bonuses for not being involved, and it kind of wiped out the difference that the um, involved players made. So it was all... Well, that was nice of him. Yeah. So their trial began on June 27th, 1921. So, (laughs) this trial was kind of a shit show, like most trials from the early 1900s. Quote, this is from... It involved gamblers and professional athletes. Yeah. So, this is a quote, I think, I didn't write down where this is from. It was either from Wikipedia or that article, because I only had two sources. Um, Before the trial, key evidence went missing from the Cook County Courthouse, including the signed confessions of Seacott and Jackson, who subsequently recanted... Some years later, the Missy Confessions reappeared in the possession of Comiskey's lawyer. (laughs) Yeah, because on top of all of this, too, we're also dealing with Chicago in the 1920s. Gamblers and probably some mob or mafia. Yeah. A little bit. It was a little corrupt. (laughs) Yeah. So, on top of that... So, yeah, you're going into the trial without these signed confessions, and the people who gave the confessions were recanting their confessions, so you cannot use them because they're not there. That'll make it a little bit difficult. Yeah, and then another (laughs) player who had been indicted, Bill Burns, he turned state's evidence and testified against his former teammates. Uh, So, quote, the most explosive testimony began July 19th when Burns took the stand and admitted that members of the White Sox had intentionally fixed the 1919 World Series. Burns mentioned the involvement of Rothstein, among others, and Rothstein was that gambler guy who, like, financed the whole thing, and testified that Seacott had threatened to throw the ball clear out of the park if needed to lose a game. <laughs> well, he was serious then. Yeah. So why could that be a signal? Just throw the ball out of the stadium. Why do you have to hit a guy? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Despite this and other evidence, the jury found them all not guilty. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay, so, like, the confessions were missing. The, like, their actions hadn't actually lost anybody any money other than people who were betting and the court didn't care about people who were betting. <laughs> like, the the actual White Sox and, like, the city of Chicago hadn't lost any money off of this. So, like, they really didn't care. And then, so, there's this thing in court proceedings called jury instructions and that's basically where the judge tells the jury you can find the defendant guilty only if blah 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 or you have to consider blah 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 whatever part of the judge's jury instructions uh told the jury that to return a guilty verdict they must find the players conspired to quote defraud the public and others and not merely throw ball games so like he made it a lot more narrow for them to find them all guilty. Mm -hmm. And that was probably why they found them not guilty, because their intention wasn't to defraud the public. It was to throw the ball games. But didn't they technically, didn't they defraud the public, though? Because all these people started betting. They did, but because it's conspiracy, you need that intention to defraud the public. And that truly wasn't. I think they were able to show that that wasn't their intention. Their intention was to get money and lose baseball games. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a really, like, narrow legalese kind of distinction, but it's a distinction nonetheless. I mean, really, it just sounds like they didn't want to find baseball players of being guilty. That's a big part of it, too. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I mean, like, this was 1921. Like, baseball was, like, the sport at the time. And, I mean, too, like, I didn't really get into this because I wanted to keep this kind of short anyway because this is a VSE. Like, this wasn't the first time that players had intentionally lost a World Series. <laughs> like, this had happened multiple times. <laughs> this, was, this was just the biggest one, I think, because all the players. Yeah. Were. Yeah, this was just, like, the biggest one. Well, and then, uh, the day after the acquittal, the new commissioner of baseball, Judge oh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, Best banned 
all of the involved players from playing in the major leagues. So that was part of it, too, was that before they, like, literally didn't have a baseball commissioner. <laughs> yeah, so they really had nobody in charge of the whole league. So. Yeah. So, like, what were Team, they going like, to do? Teams and players and all that and owners could literally just do whatever they want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if then, they didn't want to pay their players, they didn't have to. If they didn't want to go play this team, they didn't really have to. Yeah. And then Kenneth saw Mountain came in and was like, I am in charge of everything. I am the overlord of baseball. You're going to do what I say. Yeah, he dropped the hammer. Yeah, he, uh, he had an ego. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he, yeah, he banned all of the involved players. Uh, they became known as, like, the eight men out. Um, that's, like, their nickname. On top of the Black Sox, it's also the eight men out. Even though there were m- many more, me- like, players banned for this in- <laughs> scandal, uh, those are just, like, the eight from the White Sox. Um, there is debate to this day as to Shoeless Joe Jackson's involvement. Um, some people think he was just, like, there. Like, he wasn't actually involved in it. He just happened to be in the hotel room. When things were being discussed, others were like, he wasn't here at all. Just somebody else named him because they wanted to get the heat off of them. So, like, he says he didn't, he wasn't involved. We, we have no way of knowing. So, yeah. But, yeah, none of the eight men were ever able to lift the ban. Um, As far as I know, none of them are in the Hall of Fame either because of this. So, and then, yeah. Not allowed to be, because that's like the mm-hmm. same with Pete Rose. Because Pete yeah. Rose, was, he was gambling on games, but he was betting on his team to win, not lose. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, you know, a little bit better in that situation, but he's banned for life, and he's not allowed to go in the Hall of Fame. So, yeah. kind of the same situation. Even though he wasn't throwing games, he was literally just betting on the Reds to win. Mm-hmm. And these guys were actually throwing the games. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then, again, as I kind of said earlier, like, Comiskey and others in, like, team management – they knew about everything from game one, but they just kind of sat on it and let it happen and then hired Landis to clean it up. <laughs> they were basically just going to ignore it until somebody else told them that it was a problem. <laughs> well, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Comiskey never saw any, uh, you know, punishment from this. Neither did, um, like, the general manager of the team, none of the coaches, nothing. So well, even though really they all knew... You- what could you do other than saying, oh, you knew? I mean, they could have been banned, you know, like yeah, the players I guess, were. But, but I yeah. Guess they were, I guess they were going more after the players because the players were actually the ones who drew the game. Yeah, yeah, I think that like, was Kaminsky why. Didn't, Kaminsky didn't go out there and, you know, make errors and strike out and stuff. Yeah. He just kind of sat there. Yeah, I just think it's, I don't know. I just feel like it's, nowadays... If this exact oh, yeah. scenario were to happen and the owner knew, he would go down with the ship. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. Like, there's, um, the Astros got in trouble for stealing signs and yep. their manager and GM got fired mm-hmm. and fined. And, they're, I mean, they're not banned, but they got fined yeah. by MLB. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that was all I had. This is also why I didn't want to do this in a full episode, because there there really isn't a whole lot. Like, it's just not a very, like, it's kind of straightforward. There's not a lot of... But it is, it's still just a weird situation. Yeah. Because it's weird that the players were like, I want more money, let's just throw a World Series. Mm -hmm. It won't be that hard. Yeah. Which, like, honestly, it wasn't that hard. They were even able to do this pretty easily. (laughs) And it's also weird, too, that, like, they just found a random gambler who was like, sure, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, too, they're they're probably lucky that, like, the mob didn't get involved, mm-hmm. though. Because think about it, 1920s Chicago. Yeah. Like, if the mob would have gotten involved, they would have been, they would have had some issues, I think. Yeah, probably. Some bigger issues than, you know, going to trial. Yeah. Well, and I'm looking up um, Rothstein real quick. I don't think... I mean, he was kind of involved in organized crime, um, but he didn't, he was not involved in this as a member of organized crime, you know what I mean? Um, His nickname was The Brain. Well, and he was uh, in the Jewish mob in New York. He wasn't involved in Chicago crime scenes or crime families, so. Yeah. It's a different scenario, but yeah, I mean, you're right, like, 
Al Capone could have gone to them and been like, you need to lose a game. Like, yeah, and then they would have been like, oh, we're, we're in trouble. Yeah. Oh, we have to do this or we're going to get yeah. murdered. <laughs> and, like, if they would have gotten paid, they'd have been like, all right, that's fine. You know, yeah, they never would have. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? Like, Yeah, you're not going to just walk up to Al Capone and be like, you owe me money. Yeah, like, it's the Chicago mob in the 1920s. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you, you just be like, all right, sir, have a good day. Yeah. You're going to be like, oh, okay, never mind. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't really need that money. I, I was just playing. Yeah. Thank you for not breaking my kneecaps. <laughs> yeah, for like, murdering my whole family. It's yeah. Whatever. Yeah, I don't think that... They got involved in baseball at all, the Chicago mob. They were more worried yeah, about, because it's prohibition. They probably, they probably could have easily done it. Oh, they easily could have, but they were but mostly think, worried about alcohol. I mean, but they had, you know, prohibition going, and yeah. they had, like, the cops on their side, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They didn't really need baseball. Yeah, and they probably just didn't see it as, like. A way to make a lot of money. Yeah, because, like. Other than gambling, like, how are you going to be making a lot of money? And they just weren't big into gambling. They were big into being bootleggers. <laughs> Unless you went and bought the team. Yeah. Which, again, they didn't do. So. Yeah. I might do an episode on the Chicago mob at some point. But that might turn into a multi-parter because it's a whole... There's a lot there's going a lot. on. <laughs> Even just Al Capone, there's a lot going on. <laughs> so... Okay, I think we're done. Hey, look at that. We got to 25 minutes. It's just where I wanted it. Okay. Uh. Oh, yeah, this is for Patreon. Uh, thank you guys for being Patreon supporters. All two of you right now. <laughs> um, I think that's all I got. You got anything, Allie? No. Okay. Then I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>
<laughs> we will talk about that after I talk about who Gus is. Okay, that's fine. Um, is how I kind of have it set up. So I'm going to talk about who Gus is um, and all of that, kind of like his history. And then I will go into um, how he is related to me and my family and why he lives in my dining room. All slash. Right. The Hall of Ancestors, as me and my sister call it. Yes. So. And then we will also have a, a Gus in our apartment as well, correct? Yes, we yes. will. Because <laughs> Gus has to live with everyone in our family at, uh, in some at capacity. All <laughs> yes. My sister has a sticker of him on her laptop because her <laughs> house is so, like, inconsistent because yeah. of, like, she lives in, like, research facilities or, mm-hmm. like in people's, you know, random bedroom in their basement and stuff like that, so, um, but yeah, so she just has a sticker of him. I got us, like, a print of him and put him in a gaudy antique frame that Mm -hmm. suits him, but yes. It looks so cool, though. I like the frame. I love him. Uh, I will, we'll post a picture of him on our Instagram. There's one on my personal Instagram, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll move it to, like, the show's one, but, um, so, Gus is also known as Gustav Adolf II. He was the king of Sweden from 1611 to 1632. Um, so, you know, long, long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he is basically the main reason that Sweden was able to establish itself as a great power within Europe. Um, both at the time, but, like, even just, like, the the, like, political and, like, military, uh, things that he accomplished during his reign, um, are basically what set up Sweden to continue to be a great power within Mm -hmm. Europe and all of that. Um, I will continue to call him Gus just because that's what we've called him my entire life, um, but his name (laughs) is Gustav Adolf and he was the king of Sweden. Uh Um, but anyway, so he became Ooh, excuse me. a king at the age of 16, and basically um, his father, like, at the time that he became king, Sweden was just like a Baltic uh, sea, uh, a Baltic sea basin regional power, so it wasn't even necessarily, um, like, it was a country, but not necessarily, like, a, a country, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Europe was weird in the 1600s. <laughs> um, but um, at the time that he became king, his father had, his father, who was the previous king, obviously, um, had been involved in three separate wars. And so basically Gus inherited those wars from his father. Great. Um, right. So those wars were a border war with Russia and then a border war with Denmark, which was apparently like the most like, I don't know, severe of the three wars. And then there was a war uh, with Poland. That one was a more, like, personal one um, because the king of Poland at the time was uh, Gus's first cousin. And apparently Gus's father had some issue with him and yada, yada, yada. It was a whole, like, family affair. Yeah, I mean, even, like, now, in 2021, all of the, pretty much all of the royalty in Europe, they're all related to each other in some oh, way, yeah, shape, or form. For and sure. it was even more prevalent back in the day. Yeah, so, so it's, yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, I have issues with my own family, so, like, yeah, like, <laughs> and I don't we're not royalty. Would be different if you're royalty. I feel like it would right. be even worse if you're royalty, because you could start a war over Right, it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, also, but yeah. I do want to, real yes. quick, when you said it was on the Baltic Sea, I got it mixed up with the Black Sea, and I was like, wait, <laughs> what? So I, I literally just Google Mapped Sweden, and was just like, because I was like, it's one of the ones up top, right? Like, it's right. not Switzerland, and I was just like, confused the hell out of myself, because I was like, I thought that was the one near Romania, but no, that's the Black Sea. I just got my seas mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> Look, to be fair, there's a lot of them, and yeah. you Ugh. know... We're I not just got Europe. so confused because I was like, but Sweden's not down there. What are you talking about? Yeah, no, uh, the Baltic. <laughs> yeah, I got the it mixed Baltic. up with the Black Sea. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> yes, it's up by like Estonia and those places. Yeah, I was just so, I just, I confused myself because I forgot basic geography. So like, it's, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's 
fine. It's cool. Um, but yeah, up north, up north, okay? Yes. <laughs> um, so he inherited these wars, but apparently he was a really good military leader, like, actually, like, really great military leader, um, mm-hmm. and like still to this day he is regarded as one of the greatest military commanders in all of history and he is often called the father of modern warfare um or the first modern general um and that is due to his use of the military tactic of combined arms which is basically um I didn't do a lot of research into this part, but basically combined arms is where you use two different forms of arms. So say like uh, in modern terms, it would be like using like planes and tanks at the same time, Mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, So two different forms of arms um, and using them simultaneously. um, Hmm. But it... The way that it works is that if the enemy defends themselves from one of those forms of attack, it makes them more vulnerable to the other one. Yeah, yeah. Um, As opposed to um, what it uh, used to be, and I forget the name of the tactic um, off the top of my head, but it was basically that, like, you would use two forms of arms simultaneously, but, um, like defending themselves from one would also defend them from the other sort Mm -hmm. of thing. So with combined arms, it basically makes them more vulnerable. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Especially if they aren't expecting it, because this was apparently not common at the time. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. He was basically, like, the first one, and it wasn't the, um, like... The way that it is defined in modern terms, combined Mm -hmm. arms, but it was like an early form of that military tactic. And so he was kind of like the one to invent it in a way. Gotcha. Um, But yeah, so um, again, under his rule, Sweden went from just like a regional power to one of Europe's great powers. And then it was also he set up a model of early modern era government styles um so basically uh during his rule he reformed the administrative structure of the government and then um he basically set up reforms in every other aspect of the government so that it became more progressive and more modern less medieval um And so some examples of that are that he forced the nobles to grant greater autonomy to the peasants that were under their rule um he encouraged education among uh, just the entire populace, and so he had schools that were established, and most of those schools are actually still in, um, or, like, still up and running to mm-hmm. this day. Um, That's I think- so, like, as an American, like, the thought that something from the 1600s would still be running is I know, it's a very so... foreign concept to right. me. Well, because, yeah. like, everything here, which, like, we had, like, there were people here, but... Yeah, but, Then like, we, the white people came in and ruined everything. As You always. know what I mean? Like, and, yeah. like, we have, like, settlements and stuff from the 1600s, but it's not as, like, it's not like the entire country. It's, like, Massachusetts, and, it's not and like, that's it. <laughs> it's not, like, our, like, settlements that we have are usually, like, historic sites, or, like, yeah. it became a city now, but... Yeah. It's not, like, Oxford University. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not, like, a cathedral that was built in the 1600s or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's very much a, like, we this kept a... some logs and sticks yeah. and some cabins. And, and you can like, this dress is up in period now. pieces. Yeah. yeah. And we aren't still using those things for the most part, unless they're private. Yeah, ones, unless it, but... like, evolved over time into an actual city or whatever. Yeah, it's... yeah. Yeah, but just, yeah, very foreign concept. <laughs> it is, but yeah, because it was like the first school that he established is now like a grammar school, and then like another one is now a university, um, in Sweden. So, yeah, so yeah. he was really big on education, um, and then he also, um, part of his like administrative structure reform, uh, he established a 
kind of like an early form of a census. Um, basically, it was like the people would register through their parish, um, and it was a way to make taxes more efficient and standardized, um, and uh, to help with like conscription because obviously they were at war a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was a lot of things like that. So basically to modernize the government, but also make it more progressive so that mm -hmm. it wasn't just like nobles are in charge of everything all the time and the peasants are just peasants forever. So, yeah, um, that's kind of just a basic overview of what his rule was like and kind of what he established for everyone. Uh, he ended up dying at the Battle of Lutzen in 1632 at the age of 37. Um, and it was basically just that he got separated from his troops and mm -hmm. it was a big battle and all this stuff. And yeah. when they eventually found his body, they were like, oh no, he's dead. <laughs> um, I'm sure it was much sadder than that. But Probably. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the only heir... Uh, the only legitimate heir, I should say, that he left behind <laughs> was a daughter. Um, and there wasn't anything that said that, like, girls couldn't inherit the throne or anything like that. It was uh, more that she was underage. I think she was, like, uh, I don't know, she was, like, six or something. Yeah. Um, so it was, the only, like, law was that the... Um, the throne had to, like, stay within the same family line, mm -hmm. essentially, which is pretty common. Yeah. Um, but because his daughter was underage, his wife and then his ministers kind of took over the government on behalf of his daughter. Um, but all of them were kind of in line with the same thinking government-wise, and so they, like, That's carried cool. on his, uh, like, reforms and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and then just kind of a funny side, not funny, but interesting <laughs> side note, uh, his wife kept his body and then as his body decayed, uh, she just kept his heart like preserved in the castle for over a year after his death. Great. Um, and then now his heart, uh, is kept at the Ritterholm church in Stockholm. Cool. So, <laughs> if we ever go to Sweden, <laughs> I'm going to go, go see Gus's heart. That's because fair. I have to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, Hannah just got back to us on no, our I know, group I chat. <laughs> uh, she says to tell everyone I said ho. I mean, hi, hi, ho, hi, 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 ho. Okay. She's struggling because this is right after she said, go on with put me out. Oops. Sorry. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, just know that texting with <laughs> Hannah is always an adventure. Yes. <laughs> so, but she says hi. Um, yes. <laughs> she just couldn't make it. So. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Yeah. So his heart is kept at the Ritterholm Church in Stockholm. Also, yes. I'm sorry if I mispronounce all of these things. It's, uh, they know how we are. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't speak Swedish. I'm sorry. Uh, to this day, he is seen as a symbol of pride in Sweden. There are, like, statues of him everywhere and blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's because of the reforms and modernization that he implemented in Sweden. And also because he was a great military leader. So, like, in military history terms, um, like, a lot of military historians, I mean, he is, like, the father of modern warfare and stuff like that so like mm -hmm. we still use his tactics to this day uh yeah. just obviously with modern weapons and things like that so mm -hmm. just overall uh government reforms modernization military uh prowess like overall he was just a really great guy mm -hmm. so uh sweden still holds him in high regard as they should probably yeah <laughs> um and then protestants also um hold him in high regard because he was uh basically the main defender of their cause during the 30 years war and i'm not gonna go into the 30 years war because that's a whole nother no. story for another time <laughs> no so, basically just know that he was on the side of the protestants and they are still thankful okay mm -hmm. that's all you need to know yep um so, now, as for why he lives in my dining room. First of all, let me explain my dining room. Um, <laughs> basically, 
uh, the way we decorated it is okay my parents collect a lot of antiques and so we just have like antiques everywhere so we have a lot of antique furniture in your house (laughs) yes not in a bad way there's like there's just Uh, so much maybe in a bad way (laughs) maybe in a bad way we have so much stuff there's so much Uh, stuff it doesn't help that we've moved let's see my parents have moved like 24 times or something since they got married yeah um and so like we've lived in foreign countries and so we just like collect stuff from all the places we've lived Mm -hmm. but regardless um so the way that our dining room is decorated it's like antique furniture but then because it's like a formal dining room we were like let's go all out and make it like french provincial blah 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 and so it's it's ridiculous um but then all of the artwork in there is basically just all of the old pictures uh we could find of like our ancestors and stuff so it's all these like old black and white photos like the, we've got one guy whose name is innocence and he straight up looks like a mob uh leader and stuff like that <laughs> that but yeah it's basically all these old portraits of if people from our family line i mm-hmm. honestly do not know who 90 percent of them are yeah um but And so me and my sister call it the Hall of Ancestors, uh, just jokingly, because we never use it as a dining room. No. (laughs) Uh, Me and my mom use it to do puzzles. So, um, but within the dining room slash Hall of Ancestors, we have a portrait of Gus or Gustav Adolf, the King of Sweden. And that is because uh, my mom is originally from Minnesota, um which if you don't know anything about Minnesota, it is very, 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 very Swedish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like very Swedish. Like th- they still have Swedish accents half the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, she and my dad went to the same college. That is where they met. Uh, it is a private Lutheran university in St. Peter, Minnesota. Um, called Gustavus Adolphus, named after Gustav Adolf. So, (laughs) the school, like, the king and queen of Sweden, like, still visit the school, like, regular. I think it's, like, every five years or something they visit the school. (laughs) And, like, while my parents were there, um, my mom was on, like, some welcoming committee for when the king and queen visited and, like, all these things. (laughs) So the school, yeah, the school still very much has ties to Sweden and all of that, um, and with, like, the Lutheran Church and all of that, because if you don't know the history of the Lutheran Church, it came about because of Protestantism, Mm -hmm. blah, 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 and we're, again, not going to get into that, but basically, um, yeah, so the school is very Lutheran, very much still tied to Sweden, um, I think it's like they receive some of their funding from Sweden or something, which I don't really know how they get away with that, I guess, because they're a private university. Yeah. Um, but regardless, that is where my parents met. They both went to that uh, school. And then when my sister went to college, she also went to Gustavus Adolphus. And also my grandmother went there. Um, I almost went there, um, but... I decided it was too expensive, and I didn't want to be in the cold, and I liked Georgia at the time, so I stayed in Georgia. Yeah. Um, But, uh, yeah, I did, basically, it came down to when I went to college, it was either going to be the University of Georgia or Gustavus Adolphus, and so, basically, the college kind of has, like, a place within our family, Mm -hmm. and then... Um, because it is named after Gustav Adolf on campus, there is like a statue of him. Um, and like my sister has graduation photos with him, but when my parents were living in England, they went into some antique store and they found this portrait of Gustav Adolf and they were like oh this is so funny like we went to this university named after him like let's get this picture and when they took it up to like buy this portrait the like person at the register was like oh yeah it's so hard to find like these good old like antique picture frames and you can just throw away the picture and they're like no we're buying it for the picture (laughs) so um 
basically, so they bought this, and that was before I was ever born. I'm pretty sure it was before my sister was born, too, um, because she was born in England, so I don't know exactly the timeline there. But, um, but yeah, so for my entire life, we have had the portrait of Gustav Adolf in our house, and it is usually in our dining room, um... But depending on when we moved and, like, where we lived and the way our house was Mm -hmm. set up, he's sometimes been in other rooms. But for the past 10 years or so, he has lived in our dining room. Um, And we affectionately call him Gus every year for his birthday. (laughs) Me and my sister dress him up. His birthday is in December, if you don't know. I think. Maybe November? I don't remember. (laughs) Either way. Either way. It doesn't matter. Um, I look it up every year. I know it's in the fall slash winter so I just look it up every year and I'm like let's decorate Gus and then um also for Christmas we usually decorate like all of the portraits in the Hall of Ancestors but especially Gus I think one year he was a snowman one year he was Santa and all the ancestors Mm -hmm. were reindeer so (laughs) um yes so Gus is very much a part of our family Uh, We are not, like, actually related. My family is not Swedish in any way whatsoever. We are very much German. Um, (laughs) So bloodline-wise and ethnicity-wise, we are not related to us in any way whatsoever. But we consider him part of our family um, just because it's, I don't know, it's just always kind of been a thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we all affectionately call him Gus. And like I said, my sister has a sticker of him on her laptop and I got me and Shannon for when I move out of this house a portrait of him so that I will have a portrait of him as well. Me and my sister are actually fighting over the one that's in the dining room. On <laughs> as for who gets Gus uh, when we eventually, obviously I'm not looking for my parents to die anytime no, soon. But, but in the You need to get the these important eventual, things hammered out quickly. <laughs> Right, Uh, because the way my parents' wills are set up, they're just like, I don't know, split it halfway between you two. And so (laughs) the only thing that me and my sister disagree on is who gets to have Gus. Um, Right now, she's can like ship him back and forth and have a custody arrangement. (laughs) (laughs) Like, yes, you get him for this five year span, and then I have to ship it to Jess, and then Jess gets it for the next five year span. (laughs) Right. Um, Although, to be fair, because she actually went to Gustavus. Yeah. Uh, she has a little bit of an edge a in the bit, custody yeah. battle. But um, we'll see We'll see how that all yeah. pans out in, yeah. you know, the next 20 years or so. Yeah. But, um, but, yeah, so that's kind of just a basic history of who Gus is and why he is important to me and my family. Yeah. And he will be prominently displayed at our apartment, so. Yes, and in every <laughs> apartment slash house I have from here until the end of time. And if I ever have children, which is not likely, but <laughs> I will also uh, instill in them that Gus is part of the family and he will remain so till mm-hmm. the end of time forevermore. <laughs> yep. <laughs> And yeah, so <sighs> that's all, right. all I got. But <laughs> yeah. well, thank um, you. Yes. Now people, at least if they, you know, give us money, they know what we're talking about whenever you talk about Gus. So <laughs> yeah. And I always like anytime I put a picture of him up on like my personal Instagram, I always either tag it or just say something about like, this is Gus. He's the king of Sweden and he lives in my dining room. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of just like the way that I introduce him because I'm just like, you don't need the whole backstory. It's fine. That's all you need to know about him. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so that oh, is probably all that I will ever say about him in the yeah. regular podcast. Yeah. So. Yeah. You VSE friends, you Patreon <laughs> friends. You have uh, inside information now. Special inside information <laughs> into the weird traditions of Shelby's family. Yeah. That's okay. We all have weird stuff. That is one of many. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, but yeah, so thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you Um, again for donating. Um, Yes. 
I always mean to like throw that in like during our regular recordings and then I always forget but we do appreciate it so <laughs> yes we do we love you guys yeah um and we hope you're doing well yeah and that's all I have for you today so all right bye bye <laughs>